so the Krantik, I believe, was built, um, it was established in 1904. Um, then this company called the Cedar Rapids and Iowa City Railway and Light Company. I'm from Cedar Rapids, uh, went to school at the University of Iowa. So, um, you know, for about 20 years, uh, 20 plus years, um, I was in with this, this, this uh, Lynn Johnson County corridor area. Um, my interest in the Crandick line, I would say, began probably about third grade. I got one of those Arcadia publishing, you know, like local history books. Um, and there's there's a section dedicated to uh, the trains that used to be around here. So um, like the demolition of Union Station um, in Cedar Rapids um, and the interurban. So at this point in time, um, you know, interurbans are like hot new technology in the United States. Um, there's all these towns in the Midwest um, that are founded on to some founded to some extent on railroad speculation um cars aren't really a thing at this point so if you want to move everywhere the hot thing to do if you don't want to walk or take a horse is uh is by trains um so the crandick is part of this um the name is just cr and ic all smashed together um so interurban literally is just a train that goes between cities um and the contrast i'd say between like your standard intercity passenger train you know, something like, let's say that Amtrak would run, is that they tend to stop at smaller locations. So it tends to be from the city going out to like streetcar suburbs or connecting just a few cities that are pretty close to each other. Um, there's a story, I think the, the line is that interurbans used to be so ubiquitous, you could take one from Chicago to Boston, um, just hop across the different lines, you know, that's how interconnected they were. I think from a technical stance, Interurban cars tended to be a bit lighter than heavy rail cars. They tended to be self-propelled and electrified. Um, and the tracks used for interurbans had much lighter ballasts. They weren't designed to handle like super heavy weights. They were mostly in the um, Midwest and East Coast. Iowa is kind of on the western edge of like the interurban realm. Um, so yeah, I think I think it maps out pretty well that I like parts of Iowa, like Eastern Iowa is kind of on the edge of the Rust Belt and also close to the margins of where the interurbans are going to be. The interurbans were all private companies. Um, in true American fashion, a lot of them expanded way too quickly. Um, interurbans are very capital intensive ventures. You know, the tracks are expensive. The trains are expensive. Power lines are expensive. You got to maintain all that stuff. Um, so a lot of them, I think, expanded too quickly. A lot of them just kind of laid down tracks, maybe where there wasn't a business case to be made in the first place. So after some point, they just ran out of money. I think there's like three. Two of them in Chicago. So the Indiana South Shore Line goes from South Bend to Chicago. CTA's Yellow Line. And SEPTA's Norristown High Speed Line in Philadelphia. In the 1940s, service peaks um, during rationing during the Second World War. The government really tries to get people to like not drive as much. The, the number I have is up to 32 daily trips. Um, these um, trains, I think they were called like the Red Devils. They're like bought from like Ohio, um, but they have a top speed of up to 90 miles an hour. And this is kind of like the apex of the, of the, of the train line. Um, passenger services and in pretty short order, I, I think from like 
early 1951 to 1953, um, service is pretty much dismantled. It's replaced by in the, by in the Cranic by a bus franchise that's also operated by this Cranic company. I don't know when it ends, but it ends at some point in time. Uh, the, the Cranick Railway would only keep profitable ventures. The moment something became unprofitable, they would excise it. So the bus lost money, they cut it. You know, the moment the interurban, the passenger interurban lost money, they cut it. But the majority of money coming in is always going to be from the freight. The Cranick company still stays on freight. So um, as you see, the unlike a lot of interurbans, the Cranick actually survives. still have their freight operations they which where the money is um, and it's switched over to diesel uh one of these old historic hangovers of the electric operation though is that if you follow the Cranick railroad um it goes past like west long public health film building um like through the oakville campus there's still power lines that go along the railroad and that that's a side effect of um it the the electric operations that they used to have so you could imagine it would have been nice let's say you could take the train from Hubbard Park to the airport and the station could have been right by the rental car where the rental cars are in uh, at the Eastern Iowa airport. Um, and that's not, you can't do it anymore. Or, you know, like, I mean, it's even something like um, being able to go up to Cedar Rapids for a show and maybe like have a couple of drinks and you don't have to worry about whether you can drive back or not because you, you'll take the train back. Um, so those things are all gone nowadays, um, which I think is, is, is a loss that maybe people are not aware of simply because the, you know, the, the, the alternatives have been, have been taken away. A lot of the conventional narrative of the Cranick is like, oh, I'm a big local history fan. You know, trains are cool. I'm a foamer. I have like these blue striped overalls. The train was cool. Now it's gone and we're all sad about it. My, my background was I was a very pleasant uh, customer of theirs. I enjoyed going, riding the, the Crandic, the inner urban as we call it. Some people call them trolley, so I don't know. Anyway, uh, I enjoyed the Crandic. 1944 is when I was born in Waterloo. At the age of two, we moved to a farm that was located just north of Oakdale and about a half a mile from the Crandic mainline north-south railroad track. Uh, we were on that farm until 1958. We had a, uh, a little shed that was west of our property on what's now called Evergreen Road and it, this shed was located on the west side of the, south, excuse me, it'd be on the southwest side of the intersection of the Crandick and Evergreen Road. Uh, it was set such that uh, the wind and weather would hit the building on the backside because it was a three-sided building and it was open so that uh, if, if you came to the uh, uh, 
little shed, and the, you, of course, knew when the train, uh, the interurban was coming because you had an actual schedule. That it was published, and uh, so you would step out well in advance of the interurban coming and wave your hands and make you know make it known to the uh, the engineer that you were wanting to be picked up and they would stop and uh, pick you up and you'd pay for your fare and you'd you would go either to Iowa City or to uh, Cedar Rapids which is where I went to most of the time I'm thinking that I started about five years of age um, and I usually went to Cedar Rapids for two things, and it basically it was shopping, but of course at Christmas time it was to go up shopping for Christmas things and to see all the displays in the stores that downtown Cedar Rapids had Christmas-wise. And of course to see the trains running around in the stores like Sears had, uh, Montgomery Wards had uh, displays and stuff like that. that. That was always a great thing. And one of the things was they I believe there was the old adage about swing and sway and all this kind of stuff that, that was said. And you, you could sit in the cars and you'd have this nice gentle back and forth riding and you could hear the, uh, the air pumps for the, for the brakes and all that stuff, which was below you. And uh, you could hear those things run. So you'd hear that boop, 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 boop for a few minutes and then it would shut off. And, and uh, it, it was just a, a very... Uh, nice feeling, very comfortable. Uh, usually, I don't remember, well, I don't remember of it ever being packed. Uh, probably, sure, in football season or, ba or basketball, some of the sports seasons, yeah, it probably was. But we never went anywhere at that time. We always went on a off day. There was probably once or twice that I went from Iowa City all the way to Cedar Rapids. And for me, that was the end. I know it went further and it went other directions, but that was, that was the Crandic to me. I went to a one-room country school through my kindergarten through eighth grade and uh, when even when the when the train uh, stopped running the inner urbans uh, when we were out for recess and actually we went outside and did stuff unlike I guess today and if the weather was just right we could see the uh, uh, Crandic running either their freight engines uh, which were kind of a steeple cab I believe is what they're called uh, or, or the other inner urbans, it was uh, great to see that, that arm that went up to the wire that was separating uh, the two rails but high in the air so you couldn't touch it or anything like that. But that was where they got the power from and uh, there was a, an aura uh, like you see when you see the northern lights, that blue-green color. Uh, especially if it was just a little bit rainy or misty, and that was that was nifty because you'd see that just above the the locomotives or, or the interurbans going up and down the track pulling their their equipment. We got on, as I said, basically uh, at uh, the closest point for our place was this evergreen road and what they call front uh, front street coming out of. Uh, North Liberty, at that intersection, well, not at that intersection, but about a half a mile or less, and uh, at this shelter. Uh, and you could go up to Swisher or you could go all the way to Cedar Rapids if you wanted to, but there was just places, I mean, we had relatives that lived in, in Swisher, but I didn't stop there, but I just, you know, had an uh, yeah, uncle that lived there. You know, you, you could get off almost any place you wanted to. It wasn't a deal where you went just to the depot. The Crandic was 
Well, it was kind of nice for the people because they would stop almost anywhere and let you off. Uh, it wasn't like it is in some of the stuff, I guess, that goes on today. Of course, riding the, the uh, inner urban was a hoot. I mean, it was great. And so from the age of about five until, well, okay, so in May of 53 is when it stopped. And this is one little boy that was ticked off real bad because he hated to see the, the Crandy go because it was such a joy. It was so much fun to be on the inner urban riding it and, uh, and going, of course, with my then only grandmother that I had and, uh, and, the, and the time that we spent together. I think that was a great misjustice that was done to people both in Cedar Rapids and in Iowa City. You know, it all has to do with money. That's, that's what it is. Uh, the great evil, money, uh, greed. So consequently, yeah, you put those all together and the credit goes away because it wasn't obviously making enough money. And what passenger train does make money? I, I don't think there's very many in the, in the whole United States or probably even the world. Swing and sway was nice because for a little kid, on the afternoon coming back home, it was a nice place to lay down in your grandmother's lap, so to speak, and take a snooze. Oh, it was, it was a pleasure. I was young enough that I actually, 965 is, is what, uh, what's recently called, although there's another name for it, I don't know. Anyway, I think everybody knows it is 965. Uh, actually, I knew that road before it had concrete. It was a gravel road. The government, based on lobbying from car owners, um, turns a lot of dirt roads into paved highways. Um, and the government subsidized that construction, um, you know, as early as the 1920s and 30s. Um, and they don't do that for the railroads. I would say this accelerates in the 1950s and 60s with the um, with investment in the interstate highway system. The government continues this trend of subsidizing road construction um, at the expense of and abandoning rail. So that just aggravates, uh, that just compounds these issues to refer to the remaining interurbans that are around. Um, these private companies are still on the hook um, for maintaining everything, um, whereas car owners, um, Bus, bus operators get the free get they can use the roads at low cost they can gas and fuel is subsidized um which none of none of these exist in um uh, for the for the case of the railroads When I was in the legislature, I was heavily involved in the uh, saving of the old Rock Island rail line. Um, it had been in bankruptcy for 12 years when I got in, and um, I began to do some research and try to find out what we could do to save it, and we succeeded in saving it. It is now the Iowa Interstate Railroad, which is the largest regional railroad in the country. Uh, it's a very successful railroad. So I'm very proud of it. Every time I hear the whistle blow, I say, there's my train. I had worked in the League of Women Voters for 27 years. Uh, I was state president for four years. And that involved lobbying at the legislature and traveling all over the state. And I felt that I knew the issues. I knew more or less how government worked, although you never know until you get in there and see the back rooms. Um, and 
it just seemed like a logical step for me to go into the legislature. I lived in a very small town in New Mexico. The Southern Pacific came through. Uh, we used to go down and watch it go through at about 5.30 in the evening. And uh, then we traveled on the train too. You could get almost anywhere by train uh, in the 30s and 40s. Um, so I think I've always liked trains. After I married and moved here in 1951, um, is when I became aware of the, uh, of the Crandic line. It was just there, you know, and one day I decided I would write it because I knew it was going to disappear. And I wrote it up and back and, you know, by that time, it was pretty um, shabby. Uh, they had some open air cars. <laughs> um, so it was more like, it wasn't used really uh, seriously by people. It was just kind of a touristy thing, I think. I moved here because I'm married in Iowan and he was a professor here at the University of Iowa. There was a place uh, right near the university. Crandick had two stops that would have been relevant to the University of Iowa. There was one by the chapel at Hubbard Park. Um, and the one in downtown Cedar, downtown Iowa City, which I believe was where the old Capitol Town Center is now on College Street. So College Street, you know, used to go through the old mall. That's where the station was. So I guess right in that plaza type thing. One thing that was useful for college students is that a lot of them seem to have actually lived in south, southern Cedar Rapids. So you, you would live in South Cedar Rapids, take the train to school, go back at night. And what's nice for commu commuters uh, back then is that the train ran until about midnight. The tracks went uh, off of Burlington Street and then eventually they turned and they went up and they went through downtown Iowa City, made a loop type of thing and then came back. A depot. Uh, I, I can't remember the depot if there was one in Iowa City proper. but I thought there was one down on Burlington Street.
there's going to be a lot of north-south commuting from uh, Cedar Rapids to Iowa City, especially as the housing prices in Iowa City get more expensive. Um, a lot of outward growth in Iowa City's northern suburbs, North Liberty, uh, Coralville, which are both on the Cranic Line. You know, the Cranic Line cuts through both these places. Um, so I think there's a greater re- realization that, like, there's a lot of development that's actually around the railroad. Um, and the highway is beginning to reach some of its natural limits as originally planned out in the 1970s. After my work with trying to save the Iowa Interstate, or what is now the Iowa Interstate, um, I got interested in resurrecting this line, the Crandic Line, which was a very successful short line railroad. Uh, it, it moved between uh, the Chicago Northwestern in, in uh, Cedar Rapids and the Iowa Interstate, uh, carried a lot of freight. And then they have another diagonal line that goes to Amana. Um, and a, a few more uh, tracks that go other places. But the one I'm most interested in is the population corridor between Iowa City, North Liberty, and Cedar Rapids. I think we have great possibility there of putting together a successful uh, commuter rail system. And um, I think at that time we had public support for the Crandic uh, passenger line. And we had the support of Li Lu, who was the president of what is now called Alliant Energy. Uh, they own the track, they own the Crandic. And he was willing, he said, what we will do is put our freight on at night so that we can run a commuter rail in the daytime. You know, it was just great. One of the things that we talked about was putting a Y into the airport. And you could get on the train in Iowa City and ride up to the airport. You could get on the train in Cedar Rapids and ride into the airport. And that would be such a boon for us in Iowa City because it's become very expensive to get yourself from the plane to this city. There were just too many problems. For example, it's got to be convenient. It's got to be convenient. You have to have it, it, many trips a day, many options of different times to go, um, to come and go. I think you would have to have double tracks so that you could have trains traveling each direction. Um, Then you have to have a place for people to park their cars because they're going to drive to the where they get on and then they're, you know, and then when they get to the other end of the line they have to have transportation to get them to work or wherever it is they have to go. Um, And things like that made it, I think it, I think it was just too overwhelming maybe uh, for people to figure out. So you have to have the kind of public support behind it that will be able to work their way through those logistical problems. Uh, It has to integrate with the transportation plan of the city, you know. You can't just dump people out uh, at a train station that doesn't connect to anything else. Um, So I think it has to be convenient, it has to be inexpensive. People aren't going to pay you know, a lot of money to get on this train. It has to be cheaper than it would be for them to drive their car. It was very controversial. We had 
uh, opposition from every everywhere. Um, the um, highway builders, the automobile dealers, uh, bus companies, even the other railroads fought us. One of the things that I found very irritating was any time that there seemed to be progress on it, the bus company would make a, a, a special deal. You know, they were going to have one dollar to go from Iowa City to Cedar Rapids. And they'd make a big hullabaloo about that. And I thought, you know, this is just... <laughs> <laughs> it's only going to last for a week and then it's it's over and um, uh, anyway I just thought it was a very irritating to me that they did that. The individuals in the DOT were concentrating on highways and I think they felt that that was their major job. And when we started talking about rail, they, we didn't get any support from them. They just weren't there. You know, I, I hate to see everything reduced to um, monetary or financial um, question. I think that I think that getting on a highway and driving yourself 30 miles and fighting trucks and other cars is not good for people. <laughs> I think if you could get on a commuter rail and read or look out the window or visit with somebody, you would arrive at your workplace a happier person. The situation that we are presently in, uh, I've got some friends and stuff like that that have dis uh, shown very distaste for the 8380 corridor going from Iowa City to Cedar Rapids and, of course, the mess up in the intersection of 80 and 380. Uh, it, it's just a total mess. If, if the road, take the road from... Um Iowa City to Cedar Rapids. They keep widening it and widening it. And you cannot widen the road forever. And the more you widen it, the more cars use it. I mean, it's, it's self-defeating, it seems to me. The new interchange, $387, $387 million. Uh, and you could argue that a lot of that's going to be east-west traffic that's not passing through Iowa City necessarily, but like, it's a lot of money. These highways are ungodly expensive. Um, and what I would, what I wrote in the newspaper is that it's kind of weird. The way this kind of works out is that the, the, the highways are subsidized to such an extreme extent that they actually come out cheaper than the trains. So Highways in the United States, interstate highways, are funded by 90-10 formula. 90% the federal government, 10% state DOT. Um, so the government is going to pick up 90% of those costs, and the state DOT, not even local, local governments don't have to pay a penny of this for this. So it's, it's very much, you get the sense of the highway is like once you present a business case, um, this free federal cash is going to come floating down. Whereas for the federal government, for public transit projects, at best 50%. Um, and local governments have to pay money for the railroad, but they don't have to pay anything for the highway. You know, so it's not just the state DOT. Um, so it ends up becoming this really weird thing where societally the highway is more expensive, but locally the train is more expensive. So if you're a bean counter and you think, what if it's two projects both transportation, one of them we get a butt ton of free federal dollars, another one we have to pay more. Um, you know, one of them begins to look more attractive. And that has consequences. 
it's really bad for the environment. Um, you know, transportate cars, as, as especially as uh, the power grid is shift away from coal and towards re renewable sources like wind, um, the place where fossil fuel usage remains high is going to be internal combustion engine cars. So that's, you know, I think in the United States, on aggregate, transportation could be the single largest source of emissions. And within transportation emissions, single largest source is going to be private vehicles. So that's pretty bad. So rail is more efficient. Um, for example, a, uh, the hopper cars, the grain, um, that carry the grain. Uh, one hopper car will replace two and a half trucks on the highway. So if you get a hundred unit train, you've replaced 250 trucks. And the damage that that train does to the rail line is minuscule compared to the damage of 250 trucks on the highway. Now you'll see trucks that have a little sign on the back that say this truck pays so much in taxes every year. That just irritates me no end because that is a fraction of what trouble they cause. Moving people around inexpensively is just not, you're not gonna make a lot of money. Fuel is subsidized in the United States. Um, you know, air travel, the government subsidized the construction of like runways um, and airports. Um, for cars, you know, these gas tax holidays and um, as we're seeing now, um, subsidizing road construction, subsidizing fuel consumption, all that stuff um, is hidden, hidden costs that we don't see the consumer. Lyft and Uber, um, you know, subsidized by venture capital money. Um, so the railroads, you know, for a long time have been propped up by um, freight, by mail contracts, by that kind of thing. Um, so all, all, so, you know, I'd argue that all modes of transportation require some form of subsidy most of the time. Um, the railroad might not be profitable, but like the alternatives aren't either. You know, that's just, you know, you know to, to be Ben Shapiro, like that, that's a very stark sense. I would say like, you know, facts not really caring about feelings. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you might like your car and think it symbolized freedom or whatever, but it's a fact that is subsidized by the federal government. There's no way working around that. Roads are really like, they're really expensive. Um, you know, when you say, oh, who will pay for that? I think, and think first my thought was like, how is it possible that an eight lane highway, controlled access highway, these big fancy interchanges fly over whatever designs. How is that somehow the more fiscally responsible decision compared to a single line of railroad that already exists? They're like, how, how does that work? Turns out, you know, there's some, there's some machinations behind that. There seems to be some sort of recognition that maybe the trains weren't so bad. Um, and definitely by the late 2000s, early 2010s, there's a lot of discussion that congestion on 380 is getting pretty bad now. 14 years, from 2006 to 2020, a lot of feasibility studies have been run over bringing back some sort of um, passenger operations back to the Crandic. This would be directly run by government. Um, all, uh, I think the proposals are almost exclusively DMUs or diesel multiple unit cars. You now, like I saw uh, like a proposal for like getting Bud RDCs from somewhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where it is now. The tracks are still there. The right of way is still there. Crandick is actually still alive as a company, which is very unusual for a lot of interurban. A lot of these went bust in the 1930s. Um, but the... Um, any, any sense of like bringing the passenger service back is kind of stuck in development hell. Iowa City is North Liberty. Um, I haven't chalked in, if you were just for inflation, about 52, 53 million dollars. One of the problems is that we in this country think that railroads should uh, support themselves 
and that they should be profit making, uh, they're not ever going to do that. There is no passenger service in the world that um, pays for itself. The reason uh, countries subsidize their railroads is that they see it as a public service and that it's good to be able to put people on inexpensive public transportation. And that's why I support it. I see commuter rail in this corridor as a tool for helping our communities grow in a good way. Uh, not putting more, more cars out there, but allowing more people to work and enjoy life here. I would hope the people were smart enough and, and uh, would utilize that, that convenience that's there. Um, yeah, I can understand why people want to take their own car because they can stop anywhere they want to. Uh, they can go shopping at any of the malls or any of the places along the, along the way. But if Crandick was anything like they used to be, I'd say, great. And I hope it will be uh, well thought out. It's got to be well thought out. It's got to be convenient, it's got to be comfortable, it's got to be inexpensive, and, and it must be for the, uh, you've got to think further into the future than we, than we typically do. Uh, I think it can be a great thing for this area to have. The Cedar Rapids and Iowa City are the, one of the few areas in Iowa that are still growing. Um, and that kind of economic vitality right now just seems to be associated with liberal governance. Um, so maybe it'll happen. I'd like it to happen. Um, again, I don't like, I'm not super optimistic in the near future, but like there will be limits to what the highways can do. Um, you know, I three under construction like sucks to drive on, and if it's under construction like all the time, so I don't know. I mean, I think there's a ten. There seems to be a sense some a lot of the times with these things that it doesn't happen until it happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens, and then everything happens. Maybe it'll get caught up in development hell again with implementation. Um, but I think it's, it's wait and see. You know, I wouldn't want to say one way or the other. Maybe if I flip a coin, I'd say. Um, 20 years. I mean, that sounds bleak too, but. <laughs>